Hey there, investing feels overwhelming right now, doesn't it? So complicated, so many decisions, but leaving your money in the bank is not a great idea. It's losing value every single day. So if it's stressing you out and driving you nuts, why not invest smarter with Noble Gold Investments? Precious metals are simple and real. There isn't a company on the stock market today that was around 2000 years ago, but gold was. It's always been there through wars, disasters, and turmoil. Reliable, dependable, and authentic. That's why you can't go wrong with precious metals. They've always had your back. Noble Gold Investments American-based experts will show you how to set and forget your IRA or 401k. You'll get a dedicated professional assigned to you. No hassle, no call centers. This month, Noble Gold Investments is giving a free quarter ounce gold standard coin with every qualifying IRA investment. Visit noblegoldinvestments.com to claim your gold coin. That's noblegoldinvestments.com. This is seriously demonic and the energy in this place, the energy, the entities, isn't that right? These are the entities, this is the energy, this is the distorted, inverted consciousness that is running our world, that's working through the Gateses and the Schwabs and all these other people that's working through the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. This is the level that we have to deal with so that all the rest that comes from that disappears. And we live again in a world of love instead of world a world run by the demons in this place and so many other places all over the world. You have no power, only that which we give you in the form of fear. I think you are a bunch of prats and what you're doing holding souls in this realm is a bloody disgrace. You bloody idiots, frightened of you, are you bloody kidding? So, we have come to kick your ass out of this place and out of this world. Do you hear me? And if you raise it enough, they have to leave because they can't stand a high vibrational field. Hey, Inspire Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers. It's John Nolan here. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Inspired live stream. It is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. We're healthy, we're wealthy, we're whole, we're free. And uh, we're winning. Uh, you know, we'll explain in depth over these next days, weeks, and months what winning might mean. And especially today. Uh, I, I want to take this opportunity today to kind of explain the mission statement of Inspired in, in the deepest possible way. On the surface, you all know what it's about for us. It's truth, authenticity, and freedom. But what does that mean? Um, and is there a concrete mission? Yes, there is one. And we're going to talk about it today. I want to welcome everybody in the live stream, our wonderful, beautiful tribe. Ronnie's here. Sharon's here. Julie is here. The shaman from within. Um, let me see who else is. Of course, Christine is the wise thumbs in a live chat. Erica is here. Lisa is here. Welcome. Jackie, Sue, so good to see you all. Aquarius, love you all. And thanks for tuning in. Okay, so um, this is a time where we don't shy away from talking about anything anymore. And that's perhaps the most important thing. We are peeling the onion and it's our intention to get to the truth. And there is a truth. Okay, so we have talked about simulation theory before, and today I want to go into the depths of what that means in my perception, and I'll give a disclaimer right away. 
Uh, some things that I will state are facts or verifiable facts. And most things that I will state today is my theory, my intuition, um, my perspective. Okay, so that is subjective. And I want to put that disclaimer right in front of it. So we've talked about the simulation theory. And a lot of times people will say, what's the point of it all? If we are in a simulation, whatever that means, why should we do anything? Why does it matter whether we're good or bad, whether we have a, a positive or a negative life? It doesn't matter. I think uh, this concept stems from the idea that a simulation equates to a video game. And that in a video game, well, you die, you're reborn, you, you go at it again, doesn't really matter. And that's not how we view this at all. And as a matter of fact, uh, this idea that we live in an artificial or illusory world, or in a world that isn't actually the real world, isn't a world, is nothing new. It hasn't started with the Matrix movies. It hasn't even started with the, the science fiction um, the advent of science fiction in the late 1800s, early 1900s, this goes way, way, way back to all religious uh, texts and the core message, right? You, you go to Hinduism, you go to Buddhism, you go to even Christianity, we'll talk about that, and you'll see that this concept is everywhere. And I think there's a reason for it. I think it's embedded everywhere, so you can see it and you can learn it if you truly seek to do that. Buddhism talks about the, the, the illusory dreamlike nature, and, it, and, and hence uh, it teaches non-attachment to outcomes, to desires, and to the things around you. Hinduism describes this as the Maya or Lila, depending on uh, sort of the concept that you're looking at, but again, as an illusor, illusory world. Christianity teaches that this is a brief experience. And that depending on how you do, you are either going to heaven or to hell. There will be a judgment day and it'll be decided. Your performance will be reviewed and then you'll get the score. And you'll either go into eternal damnation or you will uh, live beautifully in heaven. So then you go to the indigenous cultures. And in the indigenous cultures, it's very similar. Now, every... Uh, tradition has a little bit of a different explanation, a little bit of a different flavor to it. But ultimately, if you strip down language differences, if you strip down uh, the, the idea that especially over the last few hundred years, um, the nuances have gotten lost, you find a, a similar theme. This world that we live in is not what we might call a prime reality. And how could we define a prime reality? I would say that, and this again, now I'm getting into my own perspective and perception. There is a prime designer, creator, a consciousness, an awareness, whether it personifies or not is up to that consciousness, that created and designed everything. I do believe that. I can't tell you in a, in a concept of time how that was possible and what was before that. Because I don't think in that realm the concept of time applies. But I, I do most certainly uh, feel and connect with the true creator that created everything. So that is the basis for prime reality. Within that basis of prime reality, it would seem, and this is what... Again, the research of historical data, the research of religious texts, the research of indigenous traditions might show is that there were beings and entities that fell from that consciousness or, or distanced themselves or forgot their, their connection to it and started competing with it. And I think this is a key element. They started competing with that prime creation saying, I can do that too. See, a, a isolated identity, an ego identity said, I can create a better world or I can create a world where I will capture the creation. We can't know exactly. We have the, the legends, we have the tales, we have Gnosticism that tells us a lot. Again, if you look into the depths of Hinduism, the Vedas, if you look into uh, the, the true translation of the Bible, then you find hints and clues. But there are things we cannot know solely with our mind. We have to experience them with our consciousness. And so what 
what my and our journey has led us to is the comprehension and understanding that we truly are not living the way we see this right now in our prime reality. We're living in a construct. In um, and, and, and again, we are having a hard time defining this because there's only so much language you can use and there's only so much um, symbolism that you can use. But in essence, it appears that this reality that we're in, that we might call for this brief moment here, the matrix, if you will, is an artificial copy. And the Gnostics call it a bad copy of the real thing. So what seems to happen is that we, um, as consciousness, incarnate into a body. And when that happens, we pass the veil through the veil of forgetfulness, right? I mean, this is something that's not hard to prove. Nobody can really consciously remember where they were before their birth in a way that they can remember how they learned how to ride a bike or when they went to the ocean for the first time or, or, or other lifetime memories. Almost no one can really remember that time before. Some people remember pieces, some people have glimpses, but almost no one remembers what was before. And yet our life experience clearly shows us that we were before and that we will be after. There's plenty of experiences that people are having where the body functions cease to, uh, they're not there anymore, right? The heart stops beating. They're, they're, they're for, for those minutes, they're brain dead. Their heart, everything, everything that we can measure is gone. And yet the experience continues. Now, in most tr religious traditions, the way it works is when you leave the body, so when you have physical death. So the body dies, the body ceases to exist. And when you leave it, you go into a realm and the people that have come back into the body because the body was revived at the, the near death experiences. Um, these people tell us tales that oftentimes are very similar. Most are met by either a relative or a um, religious figure that fits into their cultural upbringing. So very rarely will you hear that a Christian was met with, you know, that, that Muhammad met a Christian. And very rarely will uh, a Muslim say that they were met by Jesus. Most often it's they meet the figure that they're most familiar with through their cultural upbringing. And then what usually happens is this um, judgment or life review. This is very interesting. Um, where you are shown certain things about your life, what you have done, what, maybe what was good, what was bad. And then ultimately, almost everyone can make a decision whether they want to come back or not. Now, those who tell the story obviously came back or they couldn't have told the story. So we have this, um, we have these stories. And what we have been programmed to believe that the nature of the reality after death is inherently different than the nature of reality while we're here. So we perceive this as two separate worlds. And I believe this is one of the greatest tricks of this artificial reality is to make us believe the beginning is with birth, the end is with death. What comes after is something completely different. Now, if you go deep enough into the indigenous cultures and when you have uh, the opportunity even to have conversations, at some point when, when the topic turns to the transition out of the body, uh, you will hear one sentence over and over again. It's interesting. And the one sentence is, don't go into the light. The first light that appears is not the real light. This is interesting. This isn't language from today. This is language and concepts from ancient times, from oral traditions that have been passed on through all these generations. But why and what does it mean? So now you have to ask yourself, 
what what would be the meaning of not walking into that light that you see? And some will add that your relatives will be there. Um, a, a very a warm and beautiful, unconditional love-like feeling will be there. It will draw you in. It will pull you in. And yet, these traditions say don't walk into that light. It is a false light. So what could that point to? And here I want to go into, again, most religious traditions that haven't undergone the heavy manipulation that let's say Christianity and through the councils over the centuries where they have added and taken stuff out of the teachings, um, the, the teaching of reincarnation, right? Of karma, of the wheel of karma and reincarnation. Now this is presented as something authentic and real and created by the prime creator, the prime creator. We might question whether this concept was either distorted or hijacked, or it doesn't exist in prime reality as such at all. But what this concept says is, when you leave this body, you have this life review. Everything that you've ever done, thought of, um, everything that pertains to your life and life in general uh, in this realm is recorded in what is commonly known now it's not commonly known, but in our circles, it's known as the Akashic Records, um, which is described as a cloud-like, we now have the language to compare it to something, right? As a cloud-like field. Cloud in terms of the digital cloud, where a lot of people have their digital assets stored in. The cloud is capable of recording everything that you do digitally and keep it there for later use. And the Akashic Records have been likened to that cloud where it's been said that the Akashic Records have everything that was ever any piece of information in it. Again, this is the belief that this is a natural and an organic uh, field by the prime creator. Now, I would suggest that we're still talking about something simulated, something that is artificial in nature, that this Akashic Records is the record keeping of this world. And that it is like a cloud, right? And I'm I'm not saying I came up with all these concepts and comparisons uh, on my own. Like everyone else, I was influenced. I, I, I read, I learned, I studied. And mostly I'm guided by intuition as to what, what path I go down. So I want to make that clear that these concepts others talk about too. But here's, here's where we stand. So then you have this life review. And there is, according again to where you stand in your belief system, you might have a council there. Often people have referred to that as the Council of Twelve, where there's uh, elders almost sitting around a conference table. And you're literally like on a screen, you're, you're reviewing your life. Now, I believe that 150 years ago, those life reviews didn't happen on a screen because, again, the cultural programming didn't have that in it at that time. So I think... That image, the way it's projected into you when you transition, is very much depending on what your life was like and what your programming was like. But then you have that life review and you and you see things. And then it is said, okay, so here you have more karma um, that or, or you've gathered karma or you have resolved some karma. There's some residual karma. So um, we're gonna together, choose life situations for you to go back into, create another life, have another reincarnation in this world, only in this world, right? We're always talking about just this particular world that we're in, um, as if it is the only thing and the only opportunity to experience something. And so you go back and you go back and you go back and you go back and you're in this cycle. I think, and, and it, it, I think when you go through these in indigenous teachings and, and when you really think this through, there is a very good chance that what is happening after you leave the physical body is still part of the matrix, still part of the program, that this light is still not the real thing. But you go there and you have this connectedness and this feeling and this everything, and it is entrapping you to continue the cycle of coming here. So what is this? It would appear 
according to how this world is run and how it's been run for such a long time, where um, the main focus in this world seems to be on power, seems to be on control, seems to be on keeping the spirits, which are incarnated in a body, and we'll get to that as well, to keep them in a low vibrational state, because ultimately all we really hear about and all we really learn about and all that is historically significant is always connected to warfare, suffering, uh, tyrannies, control, power. Uh, that is the fabric of our historic teachings. That is what we learn. That is, you know, and every now and then we have um, sort of science that comes up as inventions and scientific discoveries that are sort of, that's the light in all of it, right? So the world is dark, humanity is bad, wars are everywhere, everybody's always competing for power, and then you have science, which invents things that makes life better for people, and that's how people are on the path of progress. This is the, the history, this is what we learn, right? And um, today, the main religion in the world is scientism. It is not Christianity anymore. It's not uh, Islam. It's not Hinduism. The main religion is scientism. It's easy to prove. All these religions disagree on so many things, but the proponents of these religions, the followers of these religions, are taking the same actions in this world. They're doing the same nonsensical things. They're believing the same scientific discoveries and they're following the same scientism, even though their religious beliefs seem to be vastly different, which means that they actually subscribe to the religion of scientism and they follow that. OK, so that, that's the main religion in our world today. So. It would appear that this construct. Is a copy of a much more ethereal, real earth. Now, the only reason why I can say this with such conviction is not because of the books I read, not because of the documentaries I've seen, or not because of the ancient texts I've studied. It's really because of, an, of inner journeys that I have had where I experienced a different reality that was ethereal and that felt authentic. Versus this world, the more I am in my spirit and connected to spirit, the more artificial this world appears to me. It is not of the same nature as my spirit, if that makes sense. That's, that's how I gauge what I see and what I feel. It's like I am in this world, but I am not of this world. I'm not of the same nature. I'm not of the same essence. And there are, I would... I would probably say 20 to 30 percent of the of the human family of mankind that is real, and by real I mean they're in so so the bodies are inhabited by a real spirit. The rest seems to be uh, fillers, so not real people that are filled into the picture, and they serve different purposes. They are. Uh, there, for example, they are simulating mass movements. So they could often manipulate real spirits by their sheer numbers. When millions and millions and millions of people move in the same direction politically or, or in their daily choices or by adapting technology, oftentimes real spirits can be seduced because it seems like, oh, well, everybody's doing it, so I'm going to do it too. I believe that about 70% are what we could call non player characters. Now, I don't mean by that they are. Their flesh and bones and blood are not real, but I don't think they're inhabited by a real spirit. I think they are inserted by the same entities and the same uh, technologies that are superimposing this fake reality, this matrix on us and on the real prime earth. So then again, I'll get back to the question, what is the point of it all? In my understanding, in my comprehension, this is my current view. And I will say this again. This is my, I'm not saying this is the truth. This is how I see it. There is a prime cosmos. There are, there's a plethora of life 
and and if you want to call them planets or realms, if you will, that have initially existed in a state of balance. I believe that Earth, prime Earth, was a part of that and had a special role in it and was hijacked, literally hijacked, and is being kept hijacked by this cycle of putting or, or constantly entrapping and seducing real spirit to keep reincarnating to feed with low vibrational energy, fear, suffering, warfare, and whatnot, to feed this artificial construct. This is keeping the cosmos out of balance, and it is almost like a dare or blackmail to prime creator and saying, hey, you know, you're going to come out, you're going to reveal your secrets, you're going to tell us how this really works, or do we need to go further? This is just speculation in my mind. This could be the conversation that these entities are having in a different realm. But I think that we're here. And if we recognize our true spirit, if we elevate our consciousness to where it needs to be, then we can do away with this matrix. We can liberate our beautiful prime earth and we can experience it again in the way that it was intended by the true creator, not the God of this world. Now see, the God, the, 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 the engineer, the architect of this world is not, in my perception, the eternal consciousness, prime source creator. That's not that. That's a different thing. And so there are two things that are happening right now. We are in the in the early stages of the next reset. And reset is another word that we've recently adapted. It used to be called cycles of cataclysms, right? Those were words that were used more historically. Um, where when you, again, when you go and study the records and study traditions and study ancient texts and you, you find stories that keep repeating, you find civilizations rising up, disappearing, everything's coming down again, you, it goes up, it goes down. And then there are people and uh, chronologists like Jason Brashears from Archaics who have discovered patterns, mathematical patterns that put numerical value to those cycles. And they seem to be in the same, uh, always the same number of years, always the same periods, which would point to an artificial construct because you can't have natural organic development that always coincides with the exact same cycle. It just, it just can't happen that way. That would appear that the construct, this matrix is resetting itself. Why? Why would it do that? Well, I think part of it is that we are rising in consciousness through these periods and we get to a certain point where we might break it up and boom, the reset comes. And then we, we don't always start from scratch, but I think we start uh, lower down on the, on the ladder again. So there are two things that we believe are very important in this time period. It is to awaken as quickly as possible to who we are, spirit, spirit being this prime consciousness in this experience. If we awaken to that, and if we uh, fully live that, I think we will be capable, A, to preserve that knowledge even through a reset and have a much higher starting point or even soften the whole blow of the reset and actually uh, continue raising our consciousness rather than having this big drop off, continue raising our consciousness and breaking up this artificial construct once and for all. Once and for all, liberating, liberating ourselves and liberating earth, okay? So that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, the other piece that we're talking about a lot is uh, how, how to do this, right? How to get to that point. And it seems to be that even though we are, we appear to be in this artificial construct, that the way that nature was uh, constructed 
it, it is a copy of the real thing. I think it's much more dense. I think there are elements that we don't have in the ethereal uh, Earth reality, but it would appear that the more that we connect with natural processes here, the easier we have, uh, the easier it is for us to have this inner journey. And I find this because the people that are most capable of um, expanding their awareness, expanding their consciousness, don't seem to be sitting in high rises in the city. They are usually people who spend a lot of time in nature, who who connect with um, natural rhythms. And I do think that if you expand your consciousness far enough, if you show up with discipline, you can connect with the prime, with the real thing. So you pull that into you, and that's what you then embody in this reality. So we are literally, and this is not just metaphorically, spiritually, we're literally battling a spiritual battle. And the spiritual battle is for a very solid and very uh, uh, definable victory. The victory is to break up this matrix. This, this by for all intents and purposes, seems to be an artificial electromagnetic grid, something of that nature, that pushes our vibration down, pushes our energies down, keeps us in a certain state. For those who aren't willing to give in to that, they continually break through, and, and they break through that surface, and they experience something bigger, something greater, something more powerful, and then life happens, and, and they have errands to run and, and chores to fulfill and bills to pay, and they lower again. In general, and we can measure this, right? In general, consciousness is rising. That's why the attacks on consciousness are rising as well. Because that is the only thing that is not allowed to happen. Because see, when, when a significant number of true spirits raises their consciousness above a certain level, it seems that this grid can't sustain itself any longer because it isn't getting its power from the NPCs. The NPCs are not what, what, what powers this grid. It's real human spirit. And I want to make one thing clear. Just because uh, my, it's my personal perception that 70% of people do not have a true spirit within them doesn't mean that anyone should ever do anything bad to them. Or, or treat them with lesser respect. I mean, this would be this would be the, the completely wrong conclusion. I don't go, I don't walk through life like that. But if I do not, you know, recognize a spirit, if if I tune in and there's nothing there, I simply withdraw from a conversation, withdraw from any contact. And there's no value for me in it, um, and I can't give any value because there's no spirit to receive it. If that makes any sense. But I don't mean I don't mean to ever create sort of this two-tier system. It's just something to be aware of before you go out and invest and invest and invest uh, so much of your life force and energy into something that uh, apparently cannot happen. As I've said before, if we, 20-30%, if human spirit um, recognizes itself for what it is and walks into the right direction, uh, according to this program, the masses will have to follow, right? They will have to follow. I, I do believe that will happen. Again, I'm speculating. I just want to make that clear. This is my perspective, my opinion. So there is a point in this all. And while many were entrapped to come back here, quite a few have chosen to come back here, have chosen to continue the work of liberating this. And we were, and we've been close before. We've been close to liberation before. And I think right now we are um, probably as close as we've ever been. And we still have a certain number of years, I think before, according at least to archaic data, uh, if that's true, before this next big reset. What can we bring with us? How far can we elevate our consciousness until then? Um, this can only happen through truth. I've discovered that at every layer of the onion that you peel off, there is a gatekeeper. There is an organization. There is a charismatic person. And they pull you into their story. And they show you how within their belief system you can thrive and you can have a good life. And so it all looks benevolent. And sometimes they don't even know. They're gatekeepers, but they're pulling you into their realities. And what they're saying ultimately is always, don't worry about the truth. 
That's the interesting part. Don't worry about what these dark forces are doing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And this is, to me, the great, the big lie. Because unless we discover how this really works, unless we get down to the core details of it, we will always be susceptible to be seduced into another false rabbit hole, into another false layer of reality. So at every layer of awakening, of discovering truth, there is a gatekeeper. And my or our intention is simply to follow where the, the crumbs lead us. See, there were so many stages in the last 15 years where life could have just become comfortable at that stage and it would have been fine. And we would have just traveled and, and you know, go out for drinks and go to parties and, and just have a good, comfortable, luxurious life. Because at that level of truth, there was, you know, there was a belief system that could have helped us with that. And then with the next level, the same thing. We're saying, let's leave all the boxes and just follow, intuitively guided, but follow the truth and see where it leads us. And see what it shows us. See what it shows us. Here's the thing. I don't think you can simply mentally comprehend. Oh, okay. So when I die, there's a false light. Don't walk into that light. Just turn around. I don't think you can mentally just comprehend that. And then when the experience comes, you can make the right decision. I actually think that all the programming that was introduced into our life is meant to distract you from your consciousness or from your spiritual experience, from who you really are. So trauma is introduced at birth, the way people are born today. Then more trauma is introduced in early childhood uh, through systemic abuse. And then throughout life, more trauma is introduced. And then at the end, over the last few months or years of life, most people spend it away from their loved ones. They're in some nursing homes. Uh, they're treated horribly. There, so so basically, all of which is good and true starts to vanish from them, and so then, and here's the kicker, right? So then, when they do pass, when they do leave that body, the relief of this false life, because that's what the near death experiences all share, is the relief is so great, the unconditional love. But why would our uh, our indigenous brothers and sisters continually say? That's a false light. Why would they say that? So what they say is, and they, th then they become very quiet, by the way. There's only so, so much you can hear. Stop. Stop, look around you. That's what they say. There's not much more that was ever shared with me personally or with us than that. Stop and look around you. Apparently, it requires a certain state of consciousness to be out of fear, out of worry, out of this density here in order to truly grasp what the situation is and what you're presented with. Because at every level of life, before birth, during birth, during life, during death, after death, you're always confronted with choices. None of this is truly... Um, None of this is forced, if you will. Yes, there's heavy manipulation. There's deception in every way possible. But if you want to find the truth, if that's your, if that's your intention, you will find it. It is there to find. Because none of creation, even bad creation, even bad copies, even artificial uh, constructs apparently can't happen. None of it can happen unless we consent, unless we participate in it. And this, again, leads me back to the beauty of it all, that when we're truly looking for solutions, we don't have to look any further than into the mirror or even more so inside of us. It appears that for every problem we face in this world and in our lives, the solution seems to be within us. This is uh, the greatest, um, this is sort of what, what repels people or it, it, it provides the greatest form of relief because it ultimately means you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait any longer. You don't have to wait until your income is better. You don't have to wait until somebody shows up. You don't have to wait until another president's in office. You don't have to wait until uh, a physical figure in the form of Jesus Christ returns. 
but that you can start today. I'm not talking about the ego self. I'm not talking about John Smith. I'm not talking about Ronnie and John and Sharon. I'm not talking about who we perceive our identities to be. I'm talking about the true authentic I, the spiritual I the, the, that's connected to prime consciousness. That that provides the solutions. That's provide. That's what provides the journey, the next and the next step. So the idea is that we inspire each other enough to find our way out of this, right? And while we're here to elevate this realm as much as we can, we are. We have to become the driving force again, even within this matrix. Elevate our consciousness. And with that, withdraw all the energy, all the, 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 the bad vibes, the bad juju. That's the battery of this world. The bad juju is what, what's the battery of this world. It's greed. It's fear. It's violence. It's anger. It's worry. It's doubt. It's envy, uh, jealousy. It's revenge. All these. I mean, you are fine. You are fine in the matrix. You're good in the matrix. You're successful in the matrix. If you stay in that realm, of course, that's what powers it, right? You walk into an office building in downtown anywhere, any big city that has a financial district that has all these power structures, you walk in there. And if you are someone who's connected to spirit, you can't be there for 10 minutes. It is physically impossible. Because the difference between your vibration, your level of consciousness, and that level of consciousness is so big, it makes you physically sick. There are people who used to work in corporate America or corporate Denmark or corporate, I don't know, Singapore, doesn't matter, that used to work in those structures. And they've gone through this awakening. And when they even attempt to return to that world, they get sick, literally sick. They, they get all kinds of uh, sicknesses, even cancer if necessary, to show them it is not compatible, right? You can't go back to the Agent Smiths. You can't go back into the Matrix once you have uh, started your awakening journey. So there is a very clear, there's a very clear goal um, with what we're doing. It's peeling the onion and showing all layers of truth. Because the way that we function in this human realm is we have to comprehend things. If we don't know, if we can't point our finger on what is going on, we can't come to conclusions. We can't have free thought. We're thinking in an artificial bubble. And that's why every little spiritual practice that teaches you to just don't pay any attention to any of that. Uh, truth doesn't exist. There's only your truth. <laughs> There's only your truth and whatever feels right, do it. Whatever feels good to it. They don't even distinguish between intuition and uh, just body good, because guess what? If, if you were brought up in a wrong way, your taste buds think that a Big Mac and, and chicken McNuggets are good. So your taste buds give you the information that's good. You say, oh, that feels good. Bullshit. Your body was just programmed into giving you false chemical signals. That has nothing to do with intuition. No one's intuition has ever told them that a Big Mac and Chicken McNuggets are good. No one's intuition, because they're not. They're not really compatible with this vessel here. So at every level, there are people who are teaching half-truths and half-falsehoods. There's only one quality that drives our work, and that's the truth. And we're willing, always willing to, to question our own biases question our own beliefs to this point. We have to be. We have to be willing to look back and say, okay, so at that point, this is what I had and this is what I thought. I, I did the best I could, but I have, I have new awareness. I have new information. I have a new set of facts. Now, what am I going to do? Clinch to that old belief because changing is hard or accepting that we're expanding, that our knowledge is expanding, that our inner standing is expanding, and that we are rising in consciousness. And guess what? Whatever worked four years ago, it doesn't seem to work anymore. Whatever worked two years ago, it doesn't seem to work anymore. We have to look at projects and concepts and what that we created years ago, and we have to look at every little piece and go, 
infuse it with the consciousness of now versus the consciousness of then, right? So I don't know what the name of the entity is that created this matrix. There's, you know, every culture calls it something different. Some call it Satan. Um, some call it uh, uh, Lucifer, um, the fallen angel. I mean, there's there's all kind. It, 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 that that part doesn't matter to me. That part doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is, that's me personally speaking, that I build my life, my relationships, my work, and I can only speak for me. Not not even for m my wife or my children. I only speak for me. I have to build everything around what's authentic. And I have to strip away everything that's false. Even if it means letting go of relationships, even if it means cutting ties, I cannot play a game of pretend. Even within our truth and freedom community, there's such a large section that wants to stay where the big attention is. It wants to stay within a certain with certain within certain parameters it wants to stay in the left right paradigm it wants to stay there because there is sort of this mass satisfaction we're all thinking the same thing and this thing must be right and this is where the solution is and we have to go and say there's another layer sure that layer serves a purpose but there's another layer this is not the end of the rope here there's much more to go and truly, that's only a game. That's another game to keep you in a certain perceptual reality. And so it's like taking the blinders off completely. And when you take off the blinders completely, you don't really know in the beginning what you're looking at. You have to live it. You have to explore it. You have to walk with it. You have to think through it. You have to adjust your whole being to that broadened perspective. Only with time, you can start to put the pieces into, into their right uh, uh, order. You can't know it by just taking the blinders off and thinking, oh, now I got it. No, you find yourself, bless you, my love. I'm sorry. You find yourself in a completely different way, different light, everything. And to come to a conclusion too quick keeps you from exploring it further. Um. What seems to help on all levels is to, um, you know, not distract this vessel with things that it doesn't need, not put stuff into it that hurt it. I, I will tell you this. Um, it doesn't seem that alcohol is helping one bit, so it's not part of our lives. It doesn't seem that artificial foods and processed foods and, and highly refined sugars and stuff like that is of any help so we have pretty much eliminated it all from our lives we're looking at all that we do and all that we use and all that we bring into our life under the same under this is this enhancing our journey of awakening and raising our consciousness or is it hindering it is this practice helping it or is it hindering it so th these are things that i would recommend anyone to do breath work uh, opened up whole new worlds and um, um, prayer, introspection, journeys, meditation, whatever you want to call it, opened up whole new worlds. So we've actually decided to share more of those journeys with you all in our locals community, inspired locals community. Um, after a lot of introspection and thought, we're going to share more meditations and inner journeys with you. But there is a way out. And I think what we're doing is not just trying to find our individual way out. I think this is the key point. We're not just trying to find the exit of the maze. I think what we're doing is creating a state of awareness and consciousness, co-creating a state of awareness and consciousness that allows others to not just exit the maze, but to dissolve the maze and do away with it. And do away with it for good. I think that's what we're doing here together. At least that's that's the internal mission statement it inspired. Of course, you know, you put that in a brochure, you know, it just it doesn't read as as easy as truth, authenticity, and freedom. 
but I kind of wanted to bring that to a, a clear picture for those of you who have joined us recently, who've been with us on this journey. I think you you absolutely deserve to know who we are, where we stand, what we're moving into, and and how we see things. Right? I mean, I think that's that's mutual respect, and we do respect and love you. Uh, by the way, uh, I want to tell you, I think for another thirty six hours. Or so this has been. Christine, is, is she, she sits down and she designs these things so beautifully. Everything is always working out for me. This has been uh, years ago. This is our absolute bestsellers and, and bestseller, and she put it back. Uh, so for the next 24 or 36 hours, I think it's still available. Links in the description. Um, I love when she gets inspired and she sits down and she designs something. She's absolutely in the flow of things. And, and then beautiful things appear. And we love getting pictures from you all wearing your shirts or telling us about the, uh, the, the conversations that they spark. Oftentimes, you won't believe it, but oftentimes people tell us about their airport conversations. For whatever reason, wearing one of those shirts in an airport seems to spark the most conversations. And sometimes people even <laughs> recognize each other, meaning, oh, oh, wait, did you buy that shirt on Inspired? Yeah. So they talked. I think it's just a beautiful thing. So um, this one for another 36 hours, everything's always working out for me. Love this message. Beautiful. Um, links in the description. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your purchase. It keeps the team going. It keeps the, the juices flowing and it allows us to continue our work. So thank you so much. Uh, beautiful, beautiful family. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll be back with you again very, very soon.